Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Yet Another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. And if you like this podcast, it would mean a lot if you could follow, rate, subscribe, review it, all that jazz, wherever you're watching or listening to it. With me today, I'm happy to have Vince Martin. Vince, Vince is the head writer of Overlooked Alpha. Vince, how's it going? Quite well. How are you? Thank Doing you so much great. for having me on. Hey, really appreciate you coming on. We got this going on kind of quick notice because it's a really interesting situation, but I'll get to that in a second. Let's just start the podcast the way I do every podcast with a quick disclaimer. Remind everyone, nothing on this podcast is investing advice. That's always true, but you and I are going to be talking about about a 500 million market cap company. You know, it's a med tech company. There's all so smaller med tech, all sorts of risks there. And it is one of the wilder proxy situations I've ever seen. Yeah. And, you know, a wild situation means a lot more volatility, probably a little extra risk there. So everybody should just keep that in mind. This is an investing advice. Please do your own uh, research. Uh, all that out the way, I'll turn it over to you. The company we're going to talk about is Qtera. The ticker is C-U-T-R. You and I both kind of, we connected because you published on Friday, I published on Monday. We were both looking at it at the same time. Some really wild stuff happened over the past week, but I'll stop there, stop rambling and turn it over to you. What is Qtera and why are they so interesting? Uh, Qtera is uh, what's known as an energy-based aesthetics company. Um, listeners may not know Qtera uh, or even some of the other companies in the sector, but they're probably familiar with some of the brands. So you'll see billboards uh, on interstates for cool sculpting, uh, yep. which is a uh, Zeltec that's part now part of AbbVie. Um, Qtera itself, they do uh, acne care through a cooling. They do, it's known as body contouring. It's essentially Use, it's a version of liposuction without surgery. You use and uh, these companies all use basically very concentrated energy. So um, Zeltic does they freeze the fat cells. Kutera they use an they use uh, RF radio frequency technology to heat the cells and destroy them that way. It's known as body contouring because uh, basically for regulatory reasons they can't call it what it is, which what it's supposed to be, which is basically fat removal. Um, and then there's there's vaginal health, there's uh, tattoo removal, all different. They're they're all kind of broadly speaking the same idea, which is you use concentrated energy for uh, aesthetic reasons, most mostly um, related to dermatology. Yeah. Uh, and Katera is um, certainly not the biggest player in their space, but they've been public for 20 years, uh, which I think revenue this year should be close to 300 million, if I remember off the top of my head. So a reasonably uh, large player in the space. Yeah, no, that's perfect. You know, I guess the one thing is, so they've got all these products, which you know are interesting, but I don't want to say they're me too, because this is regulated med tech, but you know, it's not like they're the only person providing the true sculpt and the body contouring. Like there, there's four or five players out there. There's nothing special. I guess the thing to get into before we can get to the real juicy proxy battle is to talk about their acne solution that they kind of rolled out last year because that's you know that's the growth driver that's the thing that differentiates them from i had some messages when i said you were coming on the podcast they're like oh i looked at this company four years ago and i thought this was great and you know it, it, these companies they always kind of disappoint you so why don't we talk about the acne product and then we can dive into the real juicy stuff um yeah because i mean i think part of his acne product appears like it it is a part of the juicy stuff or, or a catalyst for the juicy stuff um this is called Aviclear. It's it's a cooling, like I said, it's a cooling technology, so it's a little different. But this is was supposed to be a big deal for the company. It it really helped drive the stock up ahead of the launch. The launch was, uh, a commercial launch was last year, um, because they were the first ones, and that's that's a big deal in the space. Um, Zeltic is a great example of that. They really won in the in the body contouring thing, and they wound up getting taken out for close to three billion dollars. So you can, the idea with this was um, they were really ahead of the market. There's now a second competitor, but they're private. They don't appear to be, um, 
I, I don't if if Kutera executes well, th- this other company um, really shouldn't be an issue. This should really should be a market Kutera has to itself for at least a couple of years while the other other players in the space um, try and catch up. And then there'll probably be an IP lawsuit at some point because that's also the way this industry seems to go. But um, yeah, that was a big driver. And it kind of doesn't seem like it's the Q4 results are a little disappointing and it doesn't seem like it's kind of quite where. It's certainly not where investors expect it to be. That's why the stock's plunged, kind of given back most of the gains. Um, but it seems like the company itself, after Q4, was saying without saying that they were a little little disappointed with the launch. Yeah, they, I, I think they were saying a little disappointed with the launch. And they were all saying, look, your Salesforce, like one of the... One of the advantages of these, right? You have a whole product of dermatological devices, right? So you can go and sell into a derm, the True Sculpt and the Avaclear and all this sort of stuff. And you know, m- maybe each product isn't perfect, but but you can sell multiple ones. And I think they were saying, hey, our sales. I know they were saying our sales force. We might have incentivized them too hard to go after Avaclear, and they kind of stopped selling everything else. So we're right. restructuring. We're restructuring our sales force. We're restructuring our incentives. Everything. Taking another look at that, which you know sounds reasonable, but at the same time. It does blow back on the CEO. The, it blows back on everyone. Like, hey, you're not the first person to launch, you know, multiple products in in a portfolio. The fact that you so misaligned incentives for the sales force and you have to go restructure it, like that, not good, not great, Bob, not great, Bob. Yeah, uh, and yeah, and at the risk of jumping ahead, the board that was in the board letter, I think that was this morning. They actually yep. made precisely that point. And and I when I re- I had the same thought you did was that they were writing, you know, that the 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 strategy been the execution by the launch. And you're right. I mean, I think it was the CEO of Mary who literally made that. I, I believe it was him who said, who admitted on the Q4 call in February that, yeah, we, we, we didn't have the sales force set up. Right. And they were selling, they were selling Avaclear and, and didn't sell anything else. And this is really, um, I mean, we can talk about that a little bit. This is a sales driven business. This is very rarely like this is, these are not, these are not med tech products where, you know, a, a specialist understands from their training that they need X product. And they, when they start an office or when they replace or when they expand, they go get them. These are because they're cash pay. Um, the, the, one of the attractions to, to doctor's offices in particular, these are all cash pay transactions. You don't get insurance involved. So if you can, if you can get something in your office, you have it in a room, they're, they're, increasingly designed for small training and kind of short visits, like even on yep. clear is three, I think it's three 30 minute visits, right? That's correct. So you, you have one assistant handling this stuff. The paperwork's pretty minimal, minimal because you're just running or swiping a card. There's no insurance. Um, so they're attractive to doctor's offices, but at the same time, they're not something that a, a dermatologist necessarily is going to run out and call you. So you you have your sales force strategy in this business really needs to be on point. And if you look, like I said, I followed this for years and owned a couple of companies in the space. When they stumbled a lot of times, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the explanation or the excuse or the cause. The sales force had some issues. They don't perform another company's doing better. And once you fall behind, you, you, you get in trouble in a hurry. Yeah. Look, you know, the, they're not one-to-one comparables, obviously, but the, the kind of comparable is Botox, right? Like there, there is huge demand for an aesthetic, but you need to go out to the dermatologist. You need to pound the doors to get the Botox in there. You need to explain to them how to do it, how to do it quickly. And the, the doctor is going to want to do it because there's huge demand for it. And if they do it quickly, as you said, it's a cash pay product they're going to make tons of money, right? This is why right. plastic surgeons have the boats and have the fancy cars yeah. and stuff. But you, you need to go out and sell. And, you know, it's boats, even Botox, it's a competitive space. And if your salesperson isn't out there knocking on the doors, especially for a startup product like this, uh, like Aviclear, if they're not knocking on the doors, going to grab doctors on them, why to use your product over, you know, the competitor down the corner, you're not going to sell and you're not going to get all that. So it, it is, it should be a simple-ish business, but it is execution driven and it's kind of high risk, high reward. But as you said, you mentioned a couple of competitors got them taken out. Like if you get this going, it's an annuity stream, right? Once you get the Avaclear in the system, uh, you get a you get the cut of every procedure that's going forward. Right. And if the doctor, if he's fully booked up on Avaclear, guess what? He's not going to want to switch to the guy down the street because he's going to have to get the new thing in. He's going to have to learn. He's used to it. He's going to have to tell all his patients why he's switching. Like it's a pretty nice annuity stream once you do get it in there. Yeah, well, and the doctor to replace is also going to have to pay up front, you know, mid six, you know, 
150, 250, depending on yep. the product, you know, it's, it's not cheap, but yeah. And, and I'd add one more point about, about you're talking about Salesforce. One of the big things that they have to do is teach doctors how to market because a lot of doctors that's not, there are some doctors who kind of build their practices that way, but there are many who don't. And so it's not a matter of, you can put it in the room, but if the only way your patient knows it's in the rooms, you have a poster in the waiting room, you're probably, <laughs> your utilization yep. rate, I think is probably not going to be like <laughs> and, super high. You know, just on marketing, we'll go to the proxy in a second. There is also with marketing, there's benefits to scale, right? Like you have to teach the doctor how to market and that's one side of it. But if you think similar to the, a McDonald's or something, if you can get it, like if you're just marketing in the doctor's office, that's one thing. But once you have a hundred or 500 doctors, you can start doing, you know, you see the advertisements for a Botox on TV or something like you can start doing national advertising and you can start kind of doing that whole advertising instead of only in the doctor's office. Or if you think of a local market, you know, I've done some work on the Botox competitors. You think of a local market, if you have one doctor who's doing Botox to the Botox competitor, you probably can't afford a billboard. But if you have 10 doctors, you can probably take all of their advertising, put the billboard for, hey, go get Botox. Here's the 10 doctors. Like you, you can get a little bit of scale and kind of get a little bit of uh, local economies there. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Cool. So why don't we turn to, uh, you know, I think that's a fine overview of the business and we can talk valuation. It's tough to value because as we said, Abby clears a startup and if they get 2000 versus 4000 versus 400 office is going to be hugely different. We don't really know the firm economics of it, but why don't we talk about the proxy fight? Because I think that's what's most interesting. I'll just, you know, everything launches about 10 days ago. I'll just let you talk about the everything that's going on, however you want. And I'll interject if necessary. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it, it as you said, it's it's a fun one, and um, it kind of it kind of burst, you know, kind of came out of nowhere, as far as we know. It certainly seems like there's been stuff going on, um, but and you can actually correct me if I'm wrong here. I mean, I think the first public thing was the announcement that the CEO and the oh no, that was the first public. What was the first? I'm, I'm so missing this. The first public thing is April seventh. The company. Right. And anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. This is to my knowledge. But to my knowledge, the first public thing is April 7th. The company quietly files an 8K that says, hey, our executive chairman is seeking, oh, right. to, yeah. do a, is seeking to hold a special meeting to replace the board. And, you know, they quietly file an 8K. And that is that's not a quiet 8K. Yeah. That's a pretty big news. So that's how everything starts. And it just really escalates quickly from there. Right, right. So you have that. Yeah, you have that on the 7th. Um, yeah, and then there's there's letters going back and forth. The CEO, the CEO, and the chairman they come out with their side of the case. There's two, I think, it was on the 11th, right? There's two letters from major stockholders, which both of which are basically publicly saying, "Come on, guys, don't do this." <laughs> I think they both wanted the CEO replace. They wanted a special meeting, which is what the demand they wanted. That which is what the chairman and CEO has basically said: let everybody vote, but put the CEO back, and let's try and not not have this public thing. And then on the 12th, the company uh, fires, fires the chairman. And that in particular is pretty unusual. Yeah. Like it's one thing for, uh, you know, a, a CEO or CFO, but you don't really see a chairman get, get fired too often. They fired the chairman and the CEO. And, um, and then they announced the next day, right. The 13th, they say that they're, they say, okay, we'll do a special meeting. Everyone can vote. We'll, we'll figure it out from there. Uh, and then you have, um, uh, the, uh, a letter from the board this morning, kind of giving their side of the case after the, the CEO and the chairman basically said uh, the board is working to undermine us. They alleged that the board was using Kutera's counsel for their own purposes, that yep. the board, more board members were micromanaging. Um, and then the board basically came out and said, look, the chairman, <laughs> the chairman has been trying to get the CEO fired for two years and we were going to fire the CEO anyways. And um, and the point that we were saying about this, uh, the letter this morning had the point um, uh, about the public admission that the sales strategy behind Avaclear had had impacted the rest of the business. And um, I, I think that's about here where we are. The special meeting is in June May. 9th, I think, or yeah. early June, early June, uh, June 9th. You're right. Yeah, that's right. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are, and you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. 
With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Let's pick up a little bit because there's a couple parties here, right? There's the executive chairman. There's right. the CEO. There's the rest of the board. There actually is one board member who's kind of on the exec chair and CEO. Sorry, but I'll, I'll ignore them. So there's the exec executive chairman's one party, CEO's another, the rest of the board. And then there's two major shareholders here, right? And every party, I think what's interesting is every party is pushing and pulling. And I guess the first thing that's interesting to me is, and this is actually what caught my eye, the executive chairman and the CEO are the ones who kind of launched this fight, right? The, the board files that 8K we talked about that says, hey, our executive chairman is trying to call a special meeting. But basically the next day, the exec chairman and CEO come out and say, we're calling the special meeting together. And what caught my eye is the board's first response is, and you kind of alluded to it, hey, the executive chairman has been trying to get the CEO fired for several years. You know, the first letter they said it started back in 2021. And I believe the letter this morning, they said he might've even started trying in 2020. Yeah, they said 2020 and, this morning, yeah. And not only has he been, try, been trying to get the CEO fired, but the executive chairman who, you know, he runs an activist fund, the executive chairman has been trying to personally replace the, uh, replace the CEO as CEO. And what kind of caught my eye is it, it's really strange as for an executive chairman and CEO to partner and try and oust the rest of the board. But it seems really, really strange when the ex executive chairman tried to fire the CEO and now they're partnering together. And you know, part of the partnership is the CEO and chairman are saying, hey, our CEO, he's ready to retire. He was looking into succession planning, but it, it still, still strikes me as very strange that the CEO and chair would partner together after the chair tried to fire and replace the CEO. So I just want to ask you like, you know, all of these things are done for a reason. These guys are fighting over tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. What do you think is going on with the executive chairman and CEO's relationship here that they're partnering together now? I have no idea. That's a really good question. Uh, the Part of the problem with this is really fun to read about and it's fun to talk about. But when you ask questions, why is this happening? <laughs> when you're an outsider, the answer a lot of times I, I can't imagine. <laughs> you know, but um, I I don't disagree, uh, but, I, but I, okay. just on not knowing, I don't disagree. I do not know. But the speculation is interesting because all these parties should be trying to do what's rational in their head. And, you know, if you can figure out if they don't say it, but you can figure out the reasoning, like, you know, maybe they're partnering because they see $500 billion value here, or, you know, maybe they're partnering because the company's falling apart and they want to take over and like cover up what, cover up how bad they've run it or something like that. both are possible. And if you can figure out one way or the other, that's kind of where the alpha could lie. Oh, let's say that's funny. Yeah, I, I actually I kind of didn't think of it. I, I didn't think of it as that extreme. My my thought, I would think, was a little more along along your original. I, I kind of thought two things. One is, I, as you said, the CEO has, has, has said publicly that he was he I, I think in February he went to the board and said that he was thinking of retiring anyways. Yep. Um, so, I mean, one of his very clear incentives uh, is to not be fired for cause. Uh, because that's there's a, a pretty pretty substantial severance um, uh, difference there. Um, I, I think the other I think the other likely explanation is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, the CEO uh, uh, Mallory is probably not real thrilled with the chairman plants, but he may be uh, he may have less animosity based on what we're hearing. He may still have less animosity towards plants than he does to these. Uh, what the the uh, entrenched board members, as they were called in the uh, uh, as they were named in the in their letter, you know, still it is strange to me. Just just harping on that, it's strange to me that he would have he would be less he would align himself with the executive chairman who tried to fire him versus the rest of the board. Because to me, like if I just imagined a typical power struggle in my head, you would have an executive chairman who wanted to kind of take control of the company and BCO. And then you would have the CEO. And it seems like the natural alignment would be executive chairman on one side 
and the rest of the board and the CEO on another side. And again, like the CEO is trying to retire. I, I don't know what happened between kind of call it February when he announced he wanted to retire and today, but it seems like if he just stays with the independent board, tries to retire, keeps going with the succession planning, he's not getting fired for cause. So all of his retirement stuff is vesting. Like yeah, it just seems, fair. it seems a weird alignment. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a fair point. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a very good point. It, yeah, it, it. I mean, it is strange, and um, I mean, I, I, there's just a lot of strange aspects to it. To your point, you said you know you did you didn't know what had happened since February. Um, Plants and Mary said that in their letter that that um, when Mary, the CEO, went and said he wanted to retire, the board like just didn't do anything. Yep. And you kind of get the sense like from the board's response that that's probably true because one of the things that you get. You know, it's kind of funny, the board sitting there saying, hey, look, you, you know, you guys botched the Salesforce thing uh, the, the you know, you botched the, the launch of AviClear and, and having the Salesforce in the right position. And then they're writing a letter saying, basically, <laughs> we, we wanted to fire this guy for two and a half years, <laughs> but I get we were busy or so I don't know. It's, it's kind of like you kind of look at the board's letter like, OK, if this was such a train wreck that you wanted to fire him. And then he comes to you and says, I want to retire. Why are, why is this another six weeks going by when this when you're in the middle of this critical launch and you have a, yep. what you're saying is a bad CEO? Why are six weeks going by when with no interim, no plan? I mean, you would think if he comes to you in February and says, "I want to retire," you'd be like, "Great, this is this is one less thing we have to deal with." You would think that there'd be the outline of succession plan if you were talking about considering firing him for. Again, we don't. It was either 2020 or 2021, so it's two or two, two and a half years, something like that. Um, you know, so and then that kind of leads you back to the side of the chairman and CEO. Like, yeah, maybe these guys aren't really doing. Maybe these board members do need to go. So, but of course, it's because they didn't fire the CEO who's saying the board members need to go. So we're kind of going in circles there. So I'm going to come back to the exec chairman and CEO in a second, and I'm actually going to come back to all the parties in a second. But I do think one thing that jumps out is. The, the stock sold off kind of hard last week right, as this goes on because, you know, the exec chair and CEO kind of filed the first shot where they call for the special meeting. They put out uh, they put out their PR calling for it. They publish a letter from like, I think, 10 of the senior managers at Qterra saying, hey, we really support the executive chairman and CEO. And I'll come back to that in a second. But the, the stock really sold, sells off hard Thursday, Friday. I can't remember the exact day when the board does their response and their response is we are firing the executive chairman and CEO for cause. We're one of the board members is stepping up as interim CEO, and they've been very clear this is interim. They're not trying to go full time, or maybe they start changing that after. But they say that, and then the thing that I think causes the the stock to fall off really hard is they just say, and they don't really give any explanation. They just say, and we're withdrawing our 2023 yeah. guidance. And I think the market, the market's always going to shoot first and ask questions later, right? You just had the two top people at the at the company fired, and and it's a hyper growth company. You know, again, we don't know where Avaclear tops out. It launched last year. This is the year where it's supposed to be growing. They had Salesforce issues and they just withdraw 2023 guidance without anything. And that's where the stock kind of falls off and it's recovered since then. We'll, we'll talk about the other shareholders, but what do you think the board, what do you think the board is doing with the 2023 with uh, guidance withdrawal? Like, is this a continuation of the issues they see in Q4? Is this saying sales are weak or is this the board just trying to, you know, cause terror as they fire this thing to get shareholders to think, oh, we can't support this old management team. I think that there's absolute, I, I should say absolutely. I, I would, I would put a lot of money behind it, behind the, uh, behind speculation that there's some significant financial problems going on. Um, and I think there's two reasons for that. One is what you talked about with Q4 being soft and the Salesforce issues, those generally kind of don't get fixed. Um, this is a long, this is a long sales cycle business. Again, I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head to have a clear price, but most of these devices are 150 grand up front and they can get financed and, and things like that. But these are, this is not something where you, you, you fix your Salesforce stuff and they go out and sell and then they're bringing in revenue a week later. So you have that issue, but you also have the issue that, excuse me, these, um, these businesses are really, really macro sensitive. Um, and I think if you kind of look at the, some of the, the warning signs in consumer spending more generally, and um, I, I think that without this board drama, if they had withdrawn guidance for the full year at this point, it wouldn't be the most stunning thing in the world. That's kind of what these businesses do. I, 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 
uh, Kutera itself, I mean, if you look at their numbers, I can't, I'm, I'm probably getting them roughly wrong, but if you like in 06, 05 and 06, they were doing, I think like 15, 16 million in, in operating profit. And in 09, 010, they were losing almost that much. I mean, these businesses swing in a hurry. Um, so I think there may be some gamesmanship involved, but I think, and I think certainly the market believes that, that, that there's an underlying financial issue to underlying financial logic behind them withdrawing guidance for the year. See, I, I think I would tend to agree with you, but the one, the two things that make it more interesting to me are the executive chairman and the CEO are fighting really hard to take control here, right? Which I, they're fighting really hard and they're fighting from a position like they think they have strength, which I don't know if they can do as clearly if like the Q1 and guide are just an absolute disaster, if that makes sense. And then the other thing is this senior management of the company, you know, 10 of them come out in strong support of the CEO and chairman. And like, if I had run this in my mind, if you had told me everything else that happened here, my gut would have been that you had like the CFO or the top two commercial guys who had written a letter to the board, like, hey, we've been working with the CEO and exec chair for six or nine months. It, we are way underperforming our potential. Our commercial potential sales are falling off a cliff. And it's because of these guys and their strategy. We need someone new, you know, kind of like what happened with Disney, where the CFO set, kind of acts the old CEO by saying, hey, board, it's time. Like, we can't right. do this. Like, that would be my guess. But that's not what happened here, right? You had the exec, all the executive committee coming out in support of the CEO. So that's just why it's so strange. And again, it's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this situation. Yeah, I think that's true. Um yeah, I mean, one of my kind of, uh, and maybe I'm getting too skeptical in my old age, but one of, one of my thoughts with the, um, you know, with the executive letter that came out was also, I mean, they probably want one of those two guys, right? I mean, if you're the CFO or if you're a senior vice president yep. uh, of this company, uh, you and you know those guys and you, you're you probably, your job's probably a little safer with one of those two guys. And, and maybe it's a lot safer, particularly if, Particularly if you're struggling, particularly if if the narrative that you're telling yourselves and each other is, well, look, we'll be fine. We're still we have our it's a little slow, but hey, it's the economy. But, you know, like I think that I think that there's a version of the story in which. In which sales are like, you know, where, where results, if, if you could make them give guidance, they would kind of be like a little bit below the low end. Like it's not it's not like it's a disaster. It's not like there's it's everything's going wrong, but, you know, maybe revenue is going to be the target for revenue is 10 million below the low end of the original range. And maybe they're doing 60% of the out of clear installations they thought they were going to be like somewhere in there where you it's, it's enough that the people running the business can tell themselves that they're still doing a good job against external headwinds. Yep. And yet the guidance that was being given in February is probably, and probably not worth I like, and probably the management team says, Hey, the sales are falling off in late March. And guess what? You know, a lot of derms were banked by Silicon Valley and First Republic. So a lot of the derms yeah, are having, right. like, the, the, a lot of doctors are banked, especially by First Republic, I believe. So th that kind of, you could tell yourself the story. Here's the other reason I'm curious on the guidance withdrawal and why normally I'd be with you, but maybe I'm a little more skeptical that it's a disaster here because uh, Qtera. It, in the press release that the board released this morning, they don't even address the guidance. And like, I kind of think, and we'll talk about the, the big shareholders in a second, but just to sum it up, two big shareholders basically came out against the board, plus the exec chairman and CEO. Like, I, I kind of think the board, if you're waging a battle, you've got this special meeting coming up in six weeks, like your biggest bullet would be just put in, they do their first big response this morning, your biggest bullet and your ineffective and leadership and poor execution bullet for the CEO would be, hey, 2023 is off to an awful start. We are missing everything. Uh, we need somebody to come in and write this ship. And they don't really say that in the letter, right? They do say, you terrified the form 10K late. Uh, we couldn't develop, develop a budget that was grounded on supportable assumptions, but they don't say, hey, 2023 is off to an awful start. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Um, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that could be, I, I kind of, I think I, as when I read it the first time, I, I, there's the line there, I'm pulling it up here that, um, uh, 
the missteps in the rollout were, were, quote, were unforced errors that diminished our confidence in Mr. Mr. Mowry's ability to execute yep. our attractive Avaclear strategy. To me, there that to me there was a little. I, I took a little bit of that as maybe that product is disappointing. Uh, and to be clear, I don't think I, I, when I was saying like I think that there's financial logic to guidance. I don't necessarily think that 2023. Uh, actuals are going to be a disaster. I'm just saying in the past, like when the economy t- has turned real bad in, in, o- in 09, their results yep. were a disaster. So if, in a situation where the economy, or at least from the consumer standpoint, is maybe weakening, it wouldn't surprise me at all that their results are, are going to be softer than they thought they would be um, no, can, even can, six weeks ago. Completely makes sense to me. I just, you know, it, again, if I'm the board and I, we'll talk to the big shareholders in a second, but if I feel a lot of things calcifying against me, like, my first shot is to come out and be like, it, sales are just a disaster, you know, kitchen yeah. sink thing. And right. You guys can't possibly support the CEO because forget how bad fall 2022 was, forget how bad Q4 2022 was. All that matters is the future. And the fact is we were way underperforming right now and we were going to keep way underperforming under the CEO. And they don't quite see that. And yeah. I, I wonder why they don't. Yeah, oh. that's a great point. Because, I mean, you have, I can't remember any off, off head, but you definitely have heard boards make that uh, you've heard boards or activists or, or other people, you know, people in these proxy fights make exactly that claim. And, and you're Absolutely. right that they did. And that's interesting. So let's go to the, there's two big shareholders. And the other reason I'm interested is like, if you had told me you had an exec chairman and CEO versus board fight, and they, they seem ready to go to the mat here, right? My instinct would have been that the board had reached out to had had either inbounds or kind of softly reached out to a couple major shareholders and had major shareholders who were who said yeah it's been too long the ceo has underperformed and we need somebody to go and again it doesn't appear like the board does because last week uh right after the ceo and exec chair fired rtw and pure vita those are two separate firms both of them off the top of my head they're in the like seven to ten percent of the company range so these are major shareholders they switch from 13 G's to 13 D's and they publish press releases that say, hey, don't go this route. Don't fire the CEO and chairman. We support a special meeting because we want to replace the board based on we're really concerned about the board. So I look at the special committee and I say, hey, you just pissed off the exec chair and the CEO. Exec chair owns 7%. Your two other major shareholders who own about 7% each, they don't seem to support you. How does the board see a path to winning this? And again, this comes back to the, you didn't come and blast the 2023 results so far. Like, how does the board see a path to winning this? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that they're trying, I think that they're just kind of trying to make their, make their case. Um, I, I, yeah, it's hard to say. It's possible that they didn't really quite gain this out, um, you know, they fired because I mean they they announced the firing for cause on the twelfth and then they're um, calling the special meeting on the thirteenth and that itself is kind of strange which is basically like why you know did did they get a whole bunch of phone calls on the evening of the twelfth saying basically you guys better call a special meeting or else we'll do it for you um, yeah it's it's really hard to say and I it it goes back to kind of the idea that it. The, the, the complaints against these board members sort of seem valid because there's just there's not a lot of strategic doesn't seem to be a lot of strategic foresight or organization or um, and when this I mean that's one of the points that the 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 chairman and CEO made is that these guys just don't do anything um, they're they're asked for things they're told things and they don't respond and you kind of in this fight you're kind of getting really like that point seems sort of more and more. Uh, it seems to be getting more and more support from, because you're right. I don't, I don't, I can't answer that. And it doesn't, I think their path is basically to say, you know, that the CEO is going to leave anyways. Uh, he should have left. He was a bad CEO. And then the, the chairman was doing this Machiavellian stuff. So you, you don't want a guy there who's trying to line his pockets. Um, so, you know, and so if you vote for them, you're going to, you're going to wind up with this guy as CEO, Who's going to pay himself, you know, fifteen million dollar a year comp package, and that's no good. I mean, that seems to be the kind of the core, the core of their strategy. But to your point, when the other side has already got, you know, twenty odd percent of shares in their pocket, um, you know, the math starts getting going against you pretty quick. Let me go back to the executive chairman real quick. 
So he wants to become, it seems pretty clear, he wants to become the CEO. And right. I do think that the, that is interesting because the executive chairman is a partner at, I, I believe it's Voch, Vochi, Voss. It's not Yeah, Voss. I'm not sure. I kind of assumed it was Vo, Vochi or something like Vochi. that. V-O-C-E capital. Right. Uh, I, I don't personally know them. I, I've heard fine things, but he, he runs a kind of activist firm, right? He was the executive chairman here. Great. But they're, yeah, I that. mean, they're, they're, my understanding, there was a profile of them I read that they're kind of activist-ish. The tag, the tagline and like is a profile in a, uh, in an industry magazine, you know, was, was not, wasn't a hard hitting piece, but the tagline was something like always, always engaged, sometimes activist or something like that. So they're not kind of a pure, pure activist firm, but I think that's a strategy that they have used. Um, that makes sense because they, I know they were in Argo, which was an insurance company that ran into that stumbled a lot, and they eventually got that sold. He's been executive chairman here. Obviously, he's been involved here, but it, he's tried to become the the CEO. And I just think that's interesting, right? Like, if your background's in portfolio management and you're trying to become the CEO of a startup, not startup, but kind of growthy med tech sales focused company, that's interesting. What do you think, kind of his? his angle with this is does does he just think hey i can get in there focus on capital allocation hire the right guy in commercials or in commercial sales or does he mentions in one of his letters i spend 20 hours plus a week at uh at cutr like does he think he can come in here and like actually run a medtech ceo uh, be a medtech ceo i would imagine i mean i think uh, i mean we've we've seen this story before a couple times but yeah it's i mean i think it's certainly possible that he's he's in there enough that he thinks that there are material changes that he he can make um, that are really going to drive value and really drive growth and all those sorts of things. And um, who was the who was the manager? It's um, it's Vate now. Innovate. You Innovate. Yeah, oh, I know Innovate well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, is that's what was one of my thoughts was like, you know, whatever side you take, like, I really don't want to own a company whose CEO is a hedge fund manager with all due respect to any <laughs> hedge fund managers uh, listening. And I think particularly to your point about it being a med tech and being, um, if I had to have a, a hedge fund manager as CEO, I don't think this is the kind of business I would choose. But yeah, I think to your point, to your question, absolutely. He thinks he can do it. I, I, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt. He thinks that he could and should add value um, and I think I'm sure it's the kind of case where if you're there, he's probably there enough to, that he feels he knows the business well. And, and I'm sure that there are specific things that he sees that, you know, oh, if we could just get this fixed, it would really be a game changer. Uh, and why why hire and why hire someone else to do it, to fix it if you can do it yourself? Yeah, it, just, it seems to me. And again, this is outside. We we haven't even seen the, the CEO and exec chairman filed a lawsuit against the company, which I, I don't believe has been unsealed yet. It, there's still going to be more. To, but it seems to me the weakest point of the exec chair and CEO's po- point and the strongest point of the board's points is that the exec chair wanted to become the CEO himself and he doesn't have the background for it. And, you know, if this was just me, I wouldn't have tried to be the CEO of a, if I was on the board, I wouldn't have tried to become the CEO. And the first thing I would put out was, no, these guys are crazy. I'm not trying to take the CEO for yeah. job for myself. And since he hasn't done that, it seems like he is. And it, it just, it's another thing in a, a very strange, uh, in a very strange situation that strikes me as strange. Let me go back to the board. At this point, I think we've talked about, hey, three major shareholders, including the ex- former exec chairs against you, senior management seems to be against you, CEO seems to be against you, CEO is against you. Uh, the board has two paths to winning here, right? Uh, they they can go and change major shareholders' minds, and they tried to do that with the release they did today. Maybe they've got more stuff coming out. You know, they, they put a lot of stuff in there that I think is questionable on the exec chairman's comp demands and everything. Maybe they can show, hey, support us. We really do have shareholders' best interests at heart, even though it, the first, your knee-jerk reaction was for shareholders was to go the other way. So they can do that. And I think they could do that in two ways. Number one, they could hire a rock star CEO, right? Somebody who grew uh, grew Botox from zero to $10 billion or something, right? They could hire a rock star CEO. I think that's difficult here, right? Because if you're the current board, if you're a CEO who's a rock star, you've probably got your choice of companies. And this board comes to you and says, hey, our former CEO and executive chairman are running a proxy fight. Every shareholder is against us. The executive chairman clearly wants to be a CEO. You're a rock star. Why don't you come in here and we'll hire yeah. you? Like my first thought would be, 
I better negotiate a pretty good uh, firing package because I'm going to get fired the moment the new board comes in. So yeah, I don't five, know how five, they could five, get Ross Five million on day one and five million my first day and five million my last day. I'll show up. <laughs> yeah, and it'll yeah. be about 14 days of work. So yeah. I think the Rockstar CEO is really tough, though. Again, you know, we, we kind of I laid out the math where if you think AviClear is this great acne product you know you could lay out the math to 250 million 500 million even more in annual revenue maybe if you can convince a rockstar ceo that's the case you could get them in on the hey look how big this thing could be we're going to hire you in your reputation precedes you and even if we get the ex even if we lose to the exec chair and all the other people they're going to want to keep you because you're so you're so good like that's the only case i could kind of see yeah yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's tough. I, mean, I, th I think their best. I think the core of their strategy is basically going to be that the de you know the devil you know the, to shareholders going to be the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Th that um, brings. I agree, though. Again, it seems like the board's already the deck's already stacked against them. So that brings me to the other thing. I think if you're the board, your only way out of this at this point is sell the company for a huge premium before the proxy fight, right? And again, even that might be tough because. It seems like the exec share and the major shareholders are playing for a multi-billion dollar EV company. This is a, you know, 500 billion EV company currently. Seems like they want, it seems like everybody's a believer and wants to see AbiClear kind of play out and see if they can get a multi-multi bagger. But, you know, if the board could go and find a strategic to put a, a number that starts with a four in front of shareholders or something, maybe that's the only way for the board to escape. Yeah. And that's a narrow path. I mean, we're at 23 today. The stock came into the year at... 43. So, I mean, if you, yeah, so you, I mean, I, I think it's really hard just in, as a general rule, it's really hard to sell, sell a company for a price below your, your uh, year to date high, <laughs> like except in really extreme, and maybe these are extreme circumstances, but um, I think it's going to be really, you know, the, those shareholders are not going to, are not going to take, you know, a 40% premium to the current close, as you said. And the other issue too, I mentioned this a little bit in my article, the, the history of strategic acquisitions um, in this, in this industry is pretty ugly. Um, the, probably the, maybe the most unknown, horrible acquisition of the century was Hologic acquired Sinashore. Uh, in 2017, I think they paid one 1.7 billion, and less than three years later, they sold it to a private equity firm for 138 million in net cash. Um, and then the, uh, Zeltec, which we talked about, is now part of that was bought by Allergan before it was bought by Avi. Um, that was a pretty ugly deal. They got bought as soon as they got bought, their revenue tanked. So I think I think coming and going, trying to sell this company. Would just be, I think it'd be really hard to get the shareholders on board. Um, and I think the flip side is trying to find a strategic who's going to do anything other than offer, talk to themselves in offering 27 and saying, hey, look, we'll give you a little premium, get you guys out of this, and you don't have to worry about the mess, and we'll we'll take the risk of Abbey Clear disappointing. Um, but I think trying to find, trying to thread the needle on both sides to something that gets done, boy, that just seems you know, it's probably going to happen in two weeks now that I said this publicly, but <laughs> uh, it, to me, it just seems really like a pretty narrow, very, very narrow path. No, I agree. And look, I, I'm thinking through this in real time, right? The, this started last week. I published on it this morning. It, it, all these are new, but it's just the thing that's jumping out to me as we talk. And I think we said it earlier, like, I would think boards would be, I, I understand everyone isn't always hyper rational, but you would think a board before they fired the exec chairman and CEO and went down these paths, you would think they had some path. And it just, it just doesn't seem like there's a path because it, I agree with you. It seems an acquisition is unlikely, but that seems the best way they did. And if they had in their back pocket, like, Hey, two strategics have reached out to us in the past six weeks and, you know, are offering $40 per share. And we think shareholders would accept that. Like they could have done all this knowing that they could open up the strategic process, but as you said, like everybody came in here owning the stock at 40 earlier this year. If a strategic offered what's almost 100% premium and $40 per share, I'm not sure you could, this strategic could even be sure that they were, they'd be guaranteed to, shareholders would accept this and they could get this done. They'd be walking into a hairy process. They'd have to do due diligence. And as we talked about, we don't know what the current sales trends for AviClear look like. It could be a lot worse than the company thought at the beginning of the year. Like 
my God, it's just a really weird situation. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm glad you asked me to talk about it because uh, I've I've enjoyed talking about it real time too. I enjoyed writing about it. It is. It, it, it stand like these proxy fights like this that get public don't happen that often. And even in that small group, it kind of stands out for being a little, it's a little extra nuts and has a little, a little, uh, it has extra angles to kind of think through and all that stuff. And it is also to, to kind of to, to the, a broad point, it is a proxy fight where really no one's covered themselves with glory yet. <laughs> like if you don't have a position, there's not really anyone yet where you're really rooting, you're really rooting for. I guess the I guess the employees and the and and the kind of the management out below the C-suite. You hope it works out for them, but um, no one's really, from what I've seen, no one's really jumped out as somebody who um, who's really got the right strategy and it really has been in the right in the right place to this point. You know what put it over the top for me? I, I was kind of thinking, do I want to write about it? Like the CEO and chair, the chair trying to fire the CEO and then aligning with the CEO, that felt Game of Thrones style to me, right? Like <laughs> my enemy has become my friend. Like the, yeah. what, what really actually put it over the top for me last week, it wasn't the extra shareholders coming out. It wasn't the, exact. it was, there's an independent board member who I believe has worked with the exec chairman's firm before, but it was the independent board member when the board came out and said, we're firing the CEO in the chair. And one of the independent board members put out a PR in his own personal capacity saying, Hey guys, I don't support yeah. any of this. I'm just here to maximize value for shareholders. I got your back. <laughs> it was just the independent shareholder coming off the top ropes. You know, if you're Game of Thrones, he's like Littlefinger, like, you know, the big guys are moving <laughs> out and he's just looking to find where to put the knife. That was what really put it over the top for me. I was like, my God, just, I can't yeah. believe how many people are arguing with the, with the, what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> if you, you know, I laid out a bunch of things. I, I, I think we both probably agree, but might as well ask. The, the it seems like the special meeting is going to be called June 9th. There's yeah. infinite number of possibilities here, right? The company could get a get sold for a huge premium before then, as we discussed. Board could cave. We could see some. We could see a settlement where half the board stays and half the board comes. The exec chairman could become the CEO. We could see a new CEO. We could go all the way to the wire and see a vote goes go down. If you know July comes around. What do we think we're looking back in hindsight, the results of the Qterra Game of Thrones style proxy season came out to? I think the most likely outcome is that Plants, the current chairman, is the CEO. Um, how exactly that, how exactly you get there, whether it's a settlement or them or them losing the losing or the, the, the board losing the proxy, losing the, the special meeting vote. Um, I think to your point, I think the math is just against him. Um and I think that there's a little I think there's too much evidence just reading between the lines that the board um, it has been ineffectual. So if you're kind of if you're a shareholder and you're kind of on the fence, you know, I think you can believe what the board is saying, but still figure that it's just better to get those guys out of there and get someone new. Because if plants is, a, you know, if plants does kind of follow the trajectory of some other hedge fund managers, maybe you just you can just move on from him easier than you can move on from board members who have, who, who have been there for so long. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the most likely, I think that's the most likely outcome. Um, yeah. And I think, I think by the end of the year, um, I think by the end of the year, this is um, what I, we're looking at it. Like, I think I would, I would, if I had a bet, I bet stock price actually probably a little lower. And I think we're probably checking back on this going, oh, you know, it's an interesting turnaround play. Maybe if Ivy Clear gets going in 24, there's a chance here. Let me ask you one question on that. That That's one of the other reasons I, I came here, right? So you've got this company, it's got this growthy product, Ivy Clear, and everyone on all sides is arguing for it. And originally, before I was kind of convinced that the independent board probably didn't want to become full-time CEO, one of my thoughts was, oh, maybe the board, because the CEO does have, the interim CEO from the board does have the background where she could become full-time CEO if they wanted to. But one of my thoughts was, oh, maybe Avi Clear is, you know, people think this could be such a home run that everybody's kind of fighting to take control of the golden goose before it's like completely gold, if that makes sense. And, you know, I, I was attracted to that not only because you've got the exec chairman who comes from an investing background who wants to make himself CEO and seems to want to get a lot of upside tied to that. Uh, you've got RTW and uh, Pura, who I believe both have great reputations. You know, RTW was the, I'm looking right now, third or fourth largest shareholder of Prometheus, that company that just got sold for a massive, massive 
premium to Merck, you know, multi-billion dollar deal just this morning. RTW, they're big. They've got a lot. And they, you know, they filed a 13D. They clearly are willing to get involved here. I, I was just kind of wondering, does this, the thing, one of the things that attracted me other than the Game of Thrones was everybody arguing over this. Is this, everyone sees a golden goose that the stock market, you know, because it, you make all the investment up front and it takes a year or two for the recurring revenue to really kick in. Is there a golden goose here? Do they see that? Or is it kind of what you said where everybody's fighting, but if you look at the history of these things, it's up, down, up, down, but the kind of overall result is a lot of value destruction. Um, yeah. And I, th I think it's, I think, I think the possible answer is, is certainly could be both um, because what the, the numbers do change so dramatically, as you said, once you, once you start getting revenue, you know, th these things are, these launches are such a drag on profits that um, it's, and the, when they when that start when that starts to reverse when the drag goes away and and they're actually becoming accretive the, the, the earnings really really springboard um, so I think it certainly could be both um, yeah I mean I think the interim that one thing with the interim CEO uh, she in her bio I mean she retired I think like from a not a you know a, I think an SVP level job like in 2015 I think she's 67 years old so I'm a little my sense with her, I would be surprised if she's really trying. I think when they say that she's going to be interim, you know, that they mean they actually do mean interim there, that they want someone else. They uh, they have basically committed to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. President Global Vision Care and EVP at BNL. Yeah. OK, cool. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are, and you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Uh, look, Vince, this was great. I mean, this is one of the more interesting and exciting situations I've seen. And I, I put up two posts over the weekend, you know, between this one and Cano is a little buzzier and it's got some bigger yeah. personalities, but I think this one actually is a little bit more Machiavellian, but between these two, ooh, it's <laughs> going to be a fun process. Season. Anything else you want to say on Qtero? Um, no, I think, I think we covered kind of most of the, most of the, uh, we covered the fun angle, certainly, um, you know, the financials, I think, you know, you kind of alluded to that, uh, you know, valuation is down here. It, historically, relative to them, it is kind of attractive if you look at a price to revenue basis, which is not a great metric, but it has look, has some value. And um, I mean, the one thing I think which makes it interesting and, and beyond sort of the the grabbing your popcorn nature of the proxy fight is, uh, and I think you've, you've kind of come to this point a few times is if this gets resolved in the right way, and if they deliver, like this is a stock, this is a stock that can triple in, oh. in two years. There's, I mean, that's, that's one thing that is really, you know, or, well, it's fun to, to game the scenarios and stuff, but that is something that makes it intriguing just as an investment is that if they can somehow get through this and they can get this out of clear going, I mean, this is, um, it's speculative, as you said in your disclaimer up front, look, the stock dropped 28% last week. It's, there's, <laughs> it, there, in a single day, there are risks, there's huge risks, but it is um, certainly down here. There's absolutely a world where this proxy fight gets resolved one way or another. And, and people are looking back at this going, oh my God, that, that was such a dumb, like the proxy fight, who really, like that was so dumb. All people took their eye off to how good the business was. And everybody missed this opportunity because the stock's at 60 or 65, 75, whatever number you want to throw out there. That's absolutely in the realm of possibility. I, I do think that's kind of worth toward the end here um, uh, trying to call out a little bit. I, I did I did some dumb, dumb math in the post. But, you know, again, 
this is a startup product, right? It launches March or April, 2022. As we kind of talked about, it takes a while to get these things uh, fully, to get these things fully scaled up. The doctors have to learn how to sell it. You know, even if I put it in a doctor's office on in January, like it's not going to be fully ramped up by the end of January. It takes a while to get the patients for the doctors to get used to selling it for it to get kind of the name brand recognition. But I don't think it's crazy to say if this is, if this is a success, and that is a very big if, I don't think it's crazy to say this could be doing 250, 300, even 500 million in annual revenue. And you slap a multiple on a med tech multiple on like 250 of annual revenue, probably 65% gross margins. Like it's not crazy to think Avi Clear alone could be a billion, a billion five, two billion plus valuation. That would get you, as you said, to the three, four, five X on the stock you're talking about, ignoring, completely ignoring the rest of the business. Now there is you know, the devil's in the detail and the execution. There was a very big if there, but that's why I kept saying, that's kind of why I kept thinking there could be kind of like the golden goose at the end of this rainbow. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's definitely, def, definitely a possibility. Uh, I'm also aware this is one of those industries where if you follow it for too long, you get a little too jaded. Every, <laughs> every everybody that launches, I think, like, ah, I've seen that before. It'll be, it'll be gone in 18 months. A hundred percent. And like, there are a few golden gooses in this industry, but as you said, for the most part, you think you're buying a golden goose and then you take it home and it's just, it's laying normal eggs or even worse. It might be laying rotten eggs and you just <laughs> yeah. invested a hundred million into a, into a Salesforce and rolling this product out and you're not even getting a hundred million back. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, hey, Vince, I really enjoyed this. I'm going to include, for anybody who listened to this and interested, uh, interested in more, I'm going to include a link to Vince's write-up that he did on Friday. So that was before the original, the most recent board response that actually came out this morning. We're taking this uh, Monday. Is it April 17th or 18th? I can't remember. Monday, 17th, April 17th. Yeah. But so yeah. people should go read that for a background. I did another write-up. People can go find that. But Vince, I really appreciate you coming on and I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.